So thank you so much for coming to tonight's Meet the Innovators. Um, we have a great topic. It's innovative e-commerce models. And I'll briefly introduce the topic. So, you know, if you, if you think about the e-commerce industry, there's been so much innovation, whether it's, you know, the rental market or subscription commerce. And this innovation has created, you know, brands out of companies like Birchbox and Rent the Runway. And we have emerging brands like Lolly Wally Doodle and Chloe and Isabel, who are here on the panel, who've really been transforming how products are marketed online and in, in person. And so tonight we're going to talk about, you know, innovative e-commerce models, what trends are going on in the industry and where it's going. So we'll start out with some questions, then we'll get you guys to ask some questions. Just have fun tonight. So let me introduce the panel. Um, to my left, we have Emily Hickey. She's the COO of Lolly Wally Doodle. We have Chantel Waterbury, the CEO of Chloe and Isabel. Selby Drummond, the accessories editor at Vogue. Liza Kindred, the founder of Third Wave Fashion. And Andrew Mitchell, the managing partner at Z Capital. So, to introduce the topic, I thought we'd start off by maybe giving an example of an innovative a company that's implemented an innovative e-commerce model other than your own, and you know what you admire about that company. Emily, do you want to start? Um, I, I think uh, any of the the subscription businesses we we love, and especially the niche ones like our friends uh, over at BarkBox, actually the other box company, but. Uh, Matt Meeker and, and those guys, um, which I think they took a, a niche, um, uh, which is dog lovers, and uh, are able to build basically a content-driven marketing strategy to build, very quickly build an audience, and then they're just thinking about what can we sell to that audience. And the core monetization piece is the box, which is a box that comes in the mail every month with dog treats or whatever, and, uh, but they're building a lot of kind of content-based properties around that and just trying to own that customer. So I'm really interested in anything that's basically community-oriented where you isolate um, a community that might be a subset of some larger demographic that other legacy brands are targeting and then have a very tightly focused category-based brand um, just working that community. And I think um, we'll see a lot of awesome businesses that are very community and niche-oriented because I think when you're focused on a community, your decision-making gets better. And I think that you're going to see a lot of very tight, focused businesses getting built around niche communities using social media. Chantal? Any company that can get a, a lot of money out of me, I get kind of excited about. <laughs> so there's actually one that I keep going back to over and over. Um, and it's a company called Wantful. And it's because it solves one of the problems that I have, and that's how do you find the perfect gift for someone, which is really hard to do. And it's even harder to try and do online. You end up going to a store, and you don't really know what they want. And, and for those who don't know what, what Wantful is, um, it's the ability to curate a gift book for, for somebody that it could be anything from an earring to a blanket to a cologne. Um, and, and you really get to create sort of these beautiful curated gifts that still feel personalized, but it's not a gift card or cash. Um, and that's, that's something that I've used many times over. So I think that that's exciting. Like how do you solve people's problems online? And, and I think gifting has been something that I've been excited about. Um, I'm glad that Chantal couldn't say Chloe and Isabel because uh, that I, I love that model. I love her company and I love the jewelry in particular, but um, I also love the beauty counter, which just launched out in LA and it uses a similar model of, of empowering the customer to be the seller. Um, and I am really excited about companies like that because they allow people to have an ownership in the profit and the growth of the business. And like the Fuller Brush Company and the Depression, those are companies that really grab a lot of market share through ups and downs. And um, it helps grow uh, a, a, a real brand attachment and affiliation. So I would say Chloe and Isabel, the beauty counter, companies like that. Speaking of both communities and businesses that are building platforms where other people can see success, one of the things that I find really interesting is the re-commerce sites where people are actually selling goods that they own to each other. Um, we track a lot of these types of re-commerce sites, and some of them I think are, are doing a better job of it than others. I think we're actually kind of reaching market saturation, to be honest, on the re-commerce sites. But a couple of those that I really like are a company called Poshmark, which is based in the Valley, which is an iPhone app that is seeing phenomenal success. 
um, based on consumers taking pictures of their clothes and then selling them to each other. And uh, Poshmark does a great job of uh, capturing part of that transaction, and they have a really interesting business plan for uh, bringing brands on board as well. So brands are able to get involved in the conversation and involved in those transactions from the beginning, which I think is really interesting. Uh, Bib and Tuck is another interesting re-commerce company um, that actually just announced today that they raised uh, $600,000 in seed funding. So obviously there's some investors that think that's interesting as well. And part of why I think those companies will be successful is because they're allowing other people, the same way that Chloe and Isabel does, to be successful because there's consumers that are coming on and they're actually able, there are people who are making a living um, doing these things, reselling their items, which I think is fantastic. My favorite e-commerce company right now has got to be Warby Parker. Uh, because I'm a consumer-based investor and can't mention a couple of companies that I'm invested in. So, I'll, uh, But Warby Parker, um, you take a very transparent approach by informing people that you're going to deliver a brand that is exceptional, inform them it's a decent price, and you're basically taking out the middleman, which is, you know, everyone kind of knows that there's a middleman out there, but no one knows, you know, who these people are. They make products. So use the power of PR and you just deliver an amazing product and I think it'll sustain because it's in a category you know everyone needs to see so they deliver a, a value proposition um, you know with the eyesight and the prescription so big fan and Andrew since since you have the mic right now and you are the investor on the panel you know what is driving some of the innovation in the market and if anything what's holding back some of the innovation that could be there I think what's driving the, the market is actually uh, we kind of have a push-pull effect where traditionally brands and ideas were kind of pushed from the old, you know, stodgy, if you will, or just, you know, the good brands, not, not saying everything's stodgy, but just like we know that the mainstream brands, they would just push, you know, their, everyone in their company would just push out ideas and would be kind of forced to buy and, and you know, accept what they have. And, and what's happening is entrepreneurs today are really... They're saying, look, let's let's find something that's 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 niche. You know, we're we're the upstart brands. There's transparency. Let's just deliver a value proposition and really, you know, pull. You know, pull them, meaning the bigger companies, to really make something that we want, or we're going to find it somewhere else. And and what you see is, you know, it's kind of like the Whole Foods effect. All these kind of upstart brands. Um, and I think people like us consumers are really rooting for these brands to succeed. Got it. Um, anyone else want to add to that? Um, I think that social and mobile is both of those things are driving so much innovation within e-commerce. Uh, when you when you look at the statistics around not only the number of people that are shopping through a mobile device, but also stats like 74% of consumers actually look to their social networks to guide their purchases, and 91% of people trust um, the, the you know people online, the recommendations they make online, and you can build entire businesses around that. Um, and then in in terms of what's kind of holding people back or what might be holding back some of the innovation, I feel like a lot of it could just be um, kind of a lack of innovation around platforms that support these businesses. So especially for e-commerce businesses, I think a lot of the, the businesses you've seen in the past have been largely driven off of having needing a technical founder uh, because there haven't been as, as much sophistication around some of the platforms. And actually, Emily, it might be a good opportunity for you to talk about Lolly Wally Doodle because you've built your whole marketing platform on, on social. Yeah, no, we, we have. We're the, um, we're the largest business on Facebook. Still 60% of our revenues we do through the news feed. So we post um, sale items as our status updates, and then our customers comment on it with an email address and a size, and then we in email them an invoice. And uh, we have a factory of 150 people in North Carolina, and we make things to order based on what people. So if five people comment and buy, we'll make five of them. If 500 people comment, we'll make 500 of them. So... Um, and, and because of that, like actually that's really held back our, the speed of our growth because we have to build every piece of, um, it was okay when we were young and we were just 100% on Facebook, we never even had to serve traffic. I think that's what's enabling a lot of in innovation is I think the startup costs and the barriers of e to entry um, of being a, a social commerce company are a lot lower now, but th when you try to scale, you need to build your own technology and you get stuck very quickly within template driven stuff that was enabling for your first kind of X million, and when you're trying to get beyond that, it's extremely limiting, and you have to slow down. And we're building an ERP system from scratch. We're about to build our entire website from scratch. So, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Like it's <laughs> um, now, Liza, you know, with third wave fashion, you work with a lot of different um, e commerce companies. And I think when we talked before, you said you identified 35 different business models. What are some of the most innovative business models you've seen? Like, what, what's unique? 
Yeah, we do. Um, we have a database of over 700 fashion tech companies, and within it, like Veronica said, we've identified 35 different uh, types of business models. Uh, some of them are pretty basic. Some of them were really exciting and interesting and new a few years ago, like maybe flash sale sites or um, even subscription commerce sites. Uh, and some of them, I think, are really changing the way that we're shopping now. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in is uh, social production. So when uh, consumers are getting engaged much earlier on in the process than when they're actually making the purchase at the end of the game. Uh, Threadless was a company that um, was started many, many years ago for t-shirts where people would vote on a design and then it would get produced. Uh, but there's a lot of companies that are starting to do that more in fashion right now. There's a company called Stitch Collective uh, that does a similar thing for beautiful handbags that are made here in New York. People vote on it and then it gets produced. Uh, there's interesting sites like Moda Operandi where people are uh, making purchases directly from the runway, which are also uh, pre-production. So getting people involved in the process really early on, kind of to your point, Andrew, uh, when people are involved in a brand earlier, they're much more invested in it and much more likely to make a purchase. Awesome. And, and Chantelle, I'd, I'd love for you to talk about Chloe and Isabel, because you've really reinvented how products are sold. You're not necessarily selling through an online store, but through people. Yes. it's um, We actually call it social retail. Um, and again, if people don't know what you know, Coin Isabel is, we're a lifestyle fashion jewelry brand that's actually empowering female entrepreneurs through our, our platform. And one of the reasons why I decided to do that versus just maybe selling a brand to a retailer or doing brick and mortar or doing just e-commerce is because I really got excited about the idea of how can we create a meaningful opportunity for, for young women today. So whether it's by building her resume or building her bank account, there are a lot of things that are needed uh, that were largely driven off of just I will admit like it started with seeing how the millennials were impacted by a suffering economy and seeing the, the unemployment rate rise there and, and seeing just this, this very large, overeducated and underskilled population. I got excited to take something that I had dedicated the past 15 years of my life, which was in corporate fashion and retail, whether it was design or merchandising, um, I, could, I could take something and do something more meaningful with it rather than just making pretty jewelry and selling it to people. Um, so. We really took more of an omni-channel approach and said, okay, it's not about one specific channel. We allow all of our girls to make 30% um, cash of everything that they sell, but we're allowing them to really sell online, offline, and where we had to build, similar to what uh, Emily was talking about, is we had to build the entire thing from scratch because there was no technology out there that could support what, what we wanted to do. How do you allow someone to to have their own spin on it, to personalize or curate their own collection or boutique so that when they're going out to their network and saying, this is my collection, there was no technology that, that even leveraged social media or their social networks. So it became um, both a, a platform as well as a brand, um, similar to what Andrew was mentioning earlier about Warby Parker is this, the disruption alone that was needed in, in the supply chain. You know, all the points of markup, those middlemen. You know, I'm able to now design and, and produce jewelry at double the quality that at half the price that I would have done when I was making someone else's jewelry for them. It, it's just, it's been great on so many different levels for me as, as a designer to feel like, oh, I can actually use that material, you know. That's, that's so great. And I think you mentioned a few good points there. In addition, you know, you talked about omni-channel and how your customers, it's online, mobile, social, you know. Tell us a little bit about mobile, because you've now kind of mentioned that a couple of times. How is mobile playing into the innovation? And Chantel, since you spoke about it first, you know, do you want to touch on that point? Yeah, well, I feel like that's kind of where a lot of the personalization's coming about. Like, you hear a lot of people talking about personalization, which can mean a million different things. But, you know, the ultimately, mobile, it needs to be a more personalized and curated experience. Otherwise, you're extremely overwhelmed by what's coming coming at you. So for, for us, you know, our customer, my first customer is my merchandiser. So while there might be someone at the end of the day buying a piece of jewelry, all I think about every single day is how can I better support this, this person, whether it's in terms of training, like teaching her how to run a business, or having her make money. And knowing that her customers are probably going to be in touch with her through Facebook or just on, on their phones, I want to make sure that we can build an experience that allows her to showcase her style, her assortment in a way that looks great um, and accessible through a mobile device. I mean, that's how we think about it, you know, and it's about tools. How do you build apps that help her support, again, her training environment or her the, the tools in which she can see what's selling well versus a shopping experience for her? So it's it's been, um, it, it focus, it 
makes you prioritize what data you're giving someone and you have to build something where you know more about that person. So it's both kind of the tracking and the merchandising for your, for your merchants. Yeah. Everything becomes just so personalized and curated even from a data point. And Selby, what else are you seeing in terms of innovation in, in the mobile space? Well, I think mobile, I've actually been disappointed a little bit in shopping mobile. I think when people think of mobile, they think of how can I buy something on my iPhone or on my iPad. And I think part of what Chantal is talking about is using mobile more as sort of a, an omni-channel, being able to be in a store, make a purchase maybe on your iPhone through something you see in a store. I'm really interested, luxury in particular, um, you don't have the same incentive to buy a hundred thousand dollar piece of jewelry on a website that you do uh, an, a, a very marked down item on a flash sale site. So how can you create a showroom experience or how can you create an art gallery experience and then continue to translate those purchases through an online business? So Liza and I were talking just now about um, what it means to be fully integrated. I think in the beginning, there was this taboo. If you were an internet company, you weren't supposed to exist in real life. There were not supposed to be brick and mortar overheads. There was not supposed to be, you're supposed to be doing something different. And I think now there's, those boundaries are dissolving. So I can see mobile, I mean, in my ideal world, I would walk into the Prada store and I would look at a pair of shoes and if they don't have my size, it, my phone would tell me, would allow me to purchase those exact shoes in the size I wanted. In, from the store in Hawaii and then send it to me. So as we were talking about, you know, did you make that purchase at the store? Did you make that purchase online? So hopefully it can all blend and work together and, and no longer be so striated. Can I mention something about, uh, so mobile, and of course we're talking about the type of mobile that we all experience. So we all live in a developed country and we have extremely fast internet on our phones and machines that can do amazing things. So uh, what, what we're talking about right now, I want to acknowledge is not for the developing world uh, to which mobile is extremely important in many different ways. Uh, but your phone of course can do everything that your computer can do, uh, plus it does many other things. It's a gyroscope, it's a compass, um, but most importantly, it's in your pocket. Um, my phone is in my pocket right now. Uh, my phone knows where I'm at. Uh, and I have apps on my phone that can tell me the closest place that I can make certain purchases. There's so many uh, different functionalities that we have that come from our phones that we actually can't have on computers because by their nature, they're static and they don't move anywhere. Our phones have so many different capabilities that a lot of interesting uh, e-commerce companies are starting to take advantage of, uh, both for consumers that are looking to make purchases and also uh, for B2B companies. Um, there are retail companies, we're talking about e-commerce, but since we mentioned omnichannel, there are uh, B2B companies that are focused on retailers that are paying attention to co uh, consumers that are walking into a store, uh, identifying those consumers by the unique phone that's in their pocket and potentially knowing a lot about a consumer because they've logged into Facebook on their phone. And so you may not know this, but walking into a store, they may know uh, what your last post to Twitter was and they know if you've been in the store before and how long you usually stay in there. So phones, I think, uh, are, are not just for purchasing, but there's so many other things that are happening there. I think it's important to acknowledge. Yeah, so it's also about connecting that, that online consumer with the real world kind of bricks and mortar. Um, what else are we seeing, from, like since we're on the topic of omni-channel, what else are we seeing in terms of innovation? I mean, you have so many traditional bricks and mortar stores building bigger and bigger online businesses, but you also have online businesses now going into bricks and mortar. Let's talk about that. Emily, do you want to start on that? Yeah, I mean, we think about that a lot. We're 100% we're online now, and um, Andrew obviously is a big fan of Warby Parker, and there's Bonobos. Those are the two kind of go-to examples of online than offline, and that we'll probably follow that. We think a lot about, I mean, we love Facebook because it's sort of the next best thing to offline in terms of actually having, I mean, it's actually even better in some ways because we're friends with our customers on Facebook and we know them, they post really personal things to our wall, they're, you know, loud. Like, like it, to us, it, it is a relationship and there's a fabric there that um, it, it has to do with values and shared values, it's very wholesome. And uh, and we, it's it's touching, you know, I mean, we I think you couldn't go about artificially creating that connection with customers. But we're excited to create that customer online on Facebook and on Pinterest and other places where you're actually having a dialogue with your customers. Um, and then take it offline. And we, you know, our heroes are, are uh, 
brands like um, American Girl and I mean things that, that have really successfully created experiences for their customers. And uh, so when I think what's going to be really exciting is seeing online companies who've been very innovative online going offline and innovating offline because I think certainly there hasn't been much innovation offline. Um, so that's one area that we're we're really it's probably a couple funding cycles from now, but um, that's something we're really excited about is how do we take this highly participatory. Um, uh, model that we have, um, where we're doing 20 new SKUs a day and selling 50 different items a day, very you know daily fast fashion. How do we bring that offline and create a store that's as exciting? We, I mean, we've we've managed. I think we've we've created a very innovative supply chain and distribution model online, and we would never go offline without being able to replicate the experience, the customer connection, and the the cadence that we created online. So I, I think that's very exciting. Is just how does offline get reinvented based on these this new breed of companies? thinking about that space. So. The offline comment is I'm really passionate about. That was one of the things that I got most excited about was how can you innovate in the offline? Because there's something extremely powerful about being able to see, touch, try on, a product, but having been in retail for so many years, I also saw the downfalls of it. You know, I when I was in a thousand stores nationwide, I could see when the fixture fill was more than I could sell in a store. So, you know, if you've got 20% of your stores driving all this volume, it's just a very inefficient model. So, when we were looking, you know, at Chloe and Isabel, it's like, how can we take this and still have a physical presence in the form of what we call, you know, pop-up shops? I'm able to sell just as much in a physical presence without the physical cost. So, you know, it's it's thinking about how can you partner with a, a public space, whether it's a restaurant or a salon or even a local boutique and allowing our merchandisers to sell, but they're not having to pay the rent that's associated with it. It's just how do you still have that physical presence um, and not have to worry about whether you're not whether or not you're in New York City or San Francisco and really drive the turns and the gross margins that are needed for that physical fixture fill. I remember around the recession, that was a big time where pop-up shops became something when like real estate was completely empty, people weren't paying the bills, and 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 companies were just desperate to have something happening. So it's like I think people became really conditioned to that idea of a pop-up shop or a transient space. But now there is that store uh, in Chelsea called Story, which does I think month-long curated. Uh, they're like a store for a month for an online presence. So I think that is sort of solidifying the transient nature of what, what is a comfortable partnership in that way. Yeah, I think that the same way that you can't really be an offline retailer without having an online presence, you can't be an online retailer without having a touch point for your customer. I mean, Warby Parker has their store and Bonobos has their guide shops. Uh, we did an event this week at the Bobble Bar pop-up shop. There's so many different opportunities. Pop-up shops are a great opportunity, but also having uh, trunk shows or... Um, or um, partnering with other stores, partnering with other brands to get in. For any online retailer, there has to be a physical touch point because the idea that, like Chantal was saying, that we want to touch something and try it on is never going to go anywhere. And we have a lot of benefits of being online, but we are never going to be able to see our customers' faces and read the emotion and hear the words that they're using when they're talking about our merchandise through our online stores. So it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, I, I totally agree with the online offline, but let's not forget that when you're online, you got a tremendous amount of savings by not having the brick and mortar. So I totally believe in the touch points. There's certain categories of products that you sell that obviously there's sizing issues. There's, there's all kinds of things going on. But if you take, take kind of the critical mass of what happens today with online, people love online because we gave them the opportunity to return for free. So if you take that and you say, okay, well, you know, if you, if you find a model and say, how can I personalize clothing or personalize beauty or personalize whatever the case, and still let someone try that on, if you can get use the data and kind of same, the, the same characteristics when you upload certain things by yourself on Facebook, I mean, these are data points that, you know, someone can utilize. So if you're a clothing company and you say, okay, I'm going to return for free, but I'm going to, you know, personalize a, an outfit or something like that you can still leverage the same model, but actually sell product. And you know the, the lifetime value could increase depending on the selection and so forth. So it's gonna be interesting to see what happens the next couple years if these bonobos and, and companies like this actually move into a brick and mortar model. Um, I think it'll always be kind of a test PR marketing kind of thing, but I'd be surprised if they go and blow but, out. But Bonobos is in 80 stores. They're in uh, 80 Nordstrom stores. No, so, I mean, they're out there. No, no, and that's, that's great because I actually wanted to comment on Nordstrom's because I think what Nordstrom's is doing is saying, look, 
we need to be progressive because our business is, is department stores. And basically what's happened is Bonobos and all these other upstart brands, Vineyard Vines, whatever the case, you know, these are, these are good brands, but they're saying to themselves, why do I want to sell to a department store, give away 40 points and just deal with all the headache? So I give Nordstrom's kudos for actually making investments and trying to be different. They may not win on everything, but, you know, I think it's, it's definitely interesting for them. And actually, while we're on the topic of bonobos, I think, you know, Andy Dunn recently wrote an article in Medium, and he, and he said, you know, there hasn't been a billion-dollar exit in e-commerce other than Amazon and eBay. And, you know, he challenged, you know, I think he declared that bonobos would be a billion-dollar brand. But, like, you know, what is going to be the next billion-dollar um, billion e-commerce company, you know, and, and what's preventing that company from being here today? Like, what's in the way? Uh, I think the next billion dollar company will be Chloe and Isabel. <laughs> I'm also an investor, but um, I concur. I think um, I would I would actually say why why do we actually need a billion dollar company? Why do we actually need a, a billion dollar e-commerce company? If you look at the trends, you say if I can get a good product and everyone's kind of shopping, getting more personal, and these niche brands, everyone's kind of rooting for them, and we like the quality. You know what? Why do we have to have a billion dollar e-commerce? I think. You know, if you look at Amazon, people love Amazon. It's good for what Amazon can deliver. But everyone's kind of used to going to, to different, you know, websites for whatever they want. So, like, you know, you saw the trends even back with the Ebays, like these big marketplaces. Everyone had to offer all these products. Nowadays, it's being a little bit more niche and selective. So, you know, and I think Amazon is very friendly because they offer a lot of tools and they, they just, they, they kind of push people in, in certain directions that are helpful and they actually don't, they don't usually overpay or underpay, I should say. So if you have a good brand, they actually could buy you for a billion dollars and you could tell everyone you're a billion dollar company if you want, so. I, I think that the, the idea of a marketplace is really important. Um, my com the companies that I would look at would be things like Farfetch, which are capturing so much, bringing so much commerce that happens offline online. And I don't think you can be a really enormous company without um, a, a number of different revenue streams, and I like that they are are picking up so much of, of what isn't there. And I also think that um, Rent the Runway was a good example of something. You know, I kind of agree with Andrew. I don't know why you. I don't. It's not no, always I'm not necessarily I'm not offended, but, you know. bigger. <laughs> well, <laughs> I would hate for something like Farfetch or you know for people to get off mission is always a problem um, or di diluted. But uh, I did like, I remember meeting with the, the women from Rent the Runway a couple of years ago, and they were so excited about talking about, it wasn't just about the dresses for them, it was about the experience. And they could see opening up into so many different channels of the limo, the beauty product, the undergarments that you put on, the perfume, things that you couldn't return, things that you, um, you know, it, it's, it's incorporating multiple different revenue streams into the business. Um, I don't know how, I don't know if a, a single brand that doesn't include other, uh, other channels could get to be the same size as something like Amazon or eBay. I think the next million dollar e-commerce company is ASOS. That's, they're growing very quickly, very quickly, and just coming to the US. So talking about billion dollar e-commerce companies, Amazon is obviously the 800 pound gorilla. You know, what is their role in e-commerce innovation? Are they helping, are they hindering? What's their role in this whole marketplace? I, I think um, just having gone, spoken to a lot of uh, investors in the past six months, but I, I think um, in some ways it, it kind of hurts a lot of startups and, and some aspects of the ecosystem because I think a lot of people who are pontificating about the space and investing money and Andrew can speak this more directly obviously but um, are looking at Amazon and thinking well how do you compete on price how do you compete on ship times how do you, I mean it's Walmart online I mean that's who's competing with Amazon is Walmart and Amazon seems to be I think is winning but um, so from our standpoint though that's that's fine because we're a brand and we don't really think about we would never sell through Amazon and actually we've thought hard about selling through wholesale and like we've We've gone through the, the kind of Rubik's Cube of the strategy of our company and, and what are the assets here that we should build on and what's incidental and shouldn't be emphasized and how do we think through the next 24 months of how we allocate resources and stuff like that and the opportunities ahead of us. And um, we, we've we decided squarely not to go that route. We're never going to wholesale. Like we, we're we really focused on being a brand. We want to be the top kids brand in the country. And it'll probably take us, you know, seven to 10 years to do that. But we're really focused on that. And we're very focused on our values and we're focused on being authentic and, and we... 
um, went through an exercise, even in the cat past couple weeks, we hired, hired someone very corporate who started taking our uh, marketing and putting cute taglines on them, and the graphics were perfect, and it couldn't have felt like more off-brand. I think that's our strength as, as a startup is our authenticity and that we're friends with our customers. And uh, so we, we just try to focus on that and really stay out of the fray. And I do think we have a shot at being a billion-dollar company, but I don't think it's not how we really think about it, right? We just think one step at a time. How do we serve our community? How do we serve our customer? And uh, so with Amazon, I think it probably does stifle innovation. And I, Selby, I think, is right. Like the, there, I think there is, with social, maybe there is some kind of platform or marketplace play that's sitting out there that can take advantage of social energy in these kind of peer-to-peer -peer places that exist. But I haven't seen that model. I think that actually third-party platforms are very volatile to live on and to scale on. I think it'd be very difficult to build a, a billion-dollar company on top of Facebook or any social platform. Um, so I think for a while it's going to be kind of a slugfest between Amazon and Walmart, and I think you're going to see a lot of brands being built that doesn't really matter if they could be a billion-dollar company. So, yeah, I think... I it, all, it all kind of depends. I'll get back to you in a second, but it all kind of depends like what, what the end game is. I mean, if, you know, if, if you're in, if, you know, investors, I'm a business owner, it, it, you know, you got to have alignment on what the goal for the longer term of the business is. Because that'll help you kind of figure out if you want to be a billion dollar company. Do you care about being a billion dollar company? Do you want to make a you know just want to be a ten million dollar company but make two million dollars? I mean, you have choices. It's just a matter of what what you think you want to be. <clears throat> so, um, for the Amazon question, uh, Amazon does a lot of things well, and some of these other large sites like Zappos. I mean, they do search well, they do shipping well, um, but but these companies do not have an editorial point of view. They're not adding uh, any real inspiration. Uh, and inspiration, I think, is really important to e-commerce and to brands like this. And I, it is my belief that that is not something they are going to be able to do well because as companies, they're structured towards technological innovations and innovations and infrastructure and shipping and things like that. Uh, but for companies that have a genuine point of view editorially and are able to share that and are able to build real genuine communities around what they're doing, there's no competition. Amazon is for commodity purchases uh, and things you need very quickly, but the types of companies I think that we're all a little more interested in are companies that have a point of view and a community around them. Awesome. I think, I think we're going to open it up to QA because the audience has some questions. So I'm going to let the folks at Apple identify. You guys raise your hands if you have questions. I was wondering if you guys could speak about eBay now and what you think about that new model. Well, I, and actually speaking of Amazon again, Amazon is running a program where they have, uh, for $300 a year, you can get same-day shipping. So there's a lot of these companies that are looking at giving like immediate gratification, which closes the gap between going into a store and having something immediately and buying it online. It's because if you can have it in a couple of hours by the time you get off work, it's probably good enough, right? And, and part of the reason why they're having to make those innovations and change their models in that way is because there are smaller companies that are able to deliver better service in other ways, like maybe more personalized. So I think that uh, it's, it's an interesting model. It's important, but I also think that there's ways for small companies to compete. Uh, there's a company called Shoptiques that uh, does same-day shipping also, and they literally have a team of interns that like run around and, and deliver stuff. So I think it's important, and I think it's something that we are going to have to react to, but I don't think it's something to be scared of. I agree entirely with, with Liza about the, um, the original point of not offering any editorial point of view. I was looking a lot personally recently at auction sites, and there aren't any good ones. And I think people have been really scared away by eBay. And I, when I talk to people, they're, they're like, why would you want to do something in, in the auction space? eBay did it. I find using eBay for anything a nightmare. I think if somebody kind of, I'm surprised that someone hasn't already come up with a more luxurious way of shopping at auction, the way that people shop. Um, in auction catalogs and things like that. So I think there's a lot of room for competition with that, for someone who's got the guts. My, uh, my username on eBay is eBay has an awful interface. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about verticality and specific niche businesses? And um, you've, you've touched on it here and there a little bit, but I'd like to hear you maybe expand on whether you think that... Uh, a tightly focused niche vertical marketplace, for instance, would have a good chance of success as we see e-commerce evolving, um, or whether you'd rather see a more general um, destination? Um, it's kind of a broad question to see what I can do. Um, I think if you have a niche product, I think you have a chance. If you're like a you know, consumer product goods or like a jewelry line or something, you can kind of start small and be patient. I think if you 
try to be just a new niche marketplace. Um, I mean, even even then, you're kind of competing with like an Etsy, where you know people kind of niche products and they go to a platform. Um, you know, these, these are just big marketing costs just to drive people to your site. So, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule anyone out, but I, I'd say if you could maybe start with one or two products, that's probably what I would advise over a marketplace. But I don't I don't necessarily like marketplace businesses. So, Selby, do you want to add? I know you mentioned marketplaces before. Um. I, I mean, I, I tend to feel the same way about it. You should start with something that is identifiable to your consumer and your customer and be that and be that really well for them. And then, you know, but like a political campaign, as you gain traction, you can you can widen it. Um, but I would certainly start with a captive audience, with an audience that cares about one thing and you're really addressing that need for them. And then, you know, I have no reservations about growing at a pace that you can sustain and I'm, um, you know, and continuing to open that up as long as you're not losing the core of who you were speaking to, why you were relevant to those people to begin with. So I guess start focused would be my advice. Even like a one liner, I am the best X, you know, soap company and just kind of build, you know, one by one or whatever, whatever you want to build. But that's, that's my recommendation. What other questions do we have? In terms of when you create this product and you want to attract new customers and using social platforms, how do you um, accommodate for the fact that somebody won't necessarily post something or talk about the need for new glasses or perhaps um, Google glasses? For example, you know, I was introduced to Warby Parker through a friend because he had them on, but I would never go online for glasses. Does that make sense or anything? Well, I think that's something that I can speak to just personally with, with Chloe and Isabel because your point is like a friend introduced you to something. And that's kind of, again, why I think that social and mobile are, are both going to drive a lot of these, these innovations in these businesses. For us, you know, if, if your friend was posting something about Chloe and Isabel, you're more likely to to want to see what that's about or see that that necklace or that bracelet or even just understand what's the connection because it's your friend. So it's a more authentic experience. I think there's a big difference between just randomly advertising on a, on a social network or through social media versus having someone that you know um, talking about it. I think one of the biggest aha moments for us at Chloe and Isabel was to see the power of um, just your, your everyday girl. You know, I think people assumed that, oh, a big fashion blogger is going to be able to drive a lot of traffic or revenue. And they do drive traffic, but they don't necessarily drive revenue because you don't know that person. So when she's recommending to buy something, you're not like, oh, yes, I need to have it because this amazing fashion blogger has recommended it. We would see, you know, Susie out of Kansas sell 10 times more. So it's about the personal connection and it being really authentic. I would also add, um, make something so awesome that people can't help but want to share it. Yeah, I think the concept of inherent virality is really important. There, I, I remember like in the in the days of guilt launching, there were all these like, how do we come up with a trick to make people spread the news? You know, if you invite your friend, you get twenty five dollars, all that. But ultimately, that gets around what it's going to be the most valuable part of a product, which is that people really want to share, or that or that a product has an engagement built into it. So when you have a game, Words with Friends spreads because people want to play Words with Friends with their friends and they share it. Um, or people need glasses so they talk about it. I think you need to have something that, that demands word of mouth rather than trying to cheat your way into it. Hi, I'm curious how much you all think the Made in America phenomenon will matter going forward. Um, Emily, I know you guys manufacture in the U.S. Is it a surrogate for quality that matters for kind of luxury or aspirational brands, or is it a marketing tool on its own? I think a lot of companies think of it from the marketing perspective, but how do you guys see consumers responding to that? I think that's huge. That's a fantastic question. I, I personally have committed myself to only buying things that are made here, and I've found it incredibly difficult, but it's increasingly easy because people are starting to advertise that. And I, I can see that it could potentially be a surrogate for quality um, and, and almost a cheat or a shortcut to say that something's quality because it's manufactured here. But I think in, in addition to potentially being that and a marketing ploy, I think it speaks to larger social issues at hand that are changing the consumer landscape. So the same way that the recession made it, so maybe I need to start a small business or maybe I want to sell what's in my closet, um, everything that's happening out in the world is affecting what's going on. And we're reading these headlines and, and we don't want to be 
uh, responsible for some of the tragedies that are happening anymore. I sometimes refer to it as the slow fashion movement, the same way that people talk about the slow food movement, where we want to know now where was our food grown, how did it affect the environment, am I at the farmer's market talking to this farmer? People are wanting to know that about fashion now, and I think it's extremely important. And it may be all those different things, but it, I think its importance can't be overstated. It's a funny thing to say because we we do have a factory, you know, like we have we have a, we create a lot of jobs, and we one of our mission points is to try to bring back U.S. Manu manufacturing, and we we think that the on-demand model that we use is maybe like one of the only viable models. We have to do it for our supply chain has to be right here because we do things on demand. Otherwise, actually, about fifty percent of what we do, we'll bring in a base unit from abroad and embellish it here. The final mile stuff will get done here. 50% we make from scratch with fabrics in the United States. But for us, the marketing narrative of the company isn't made in the USA. And I don't think it would be worth the money for us to manufacture everything in the USA just to achieve that marketing benefit because we think customers are still very price sensitive, basically. I think that's still driving the purchase. I think loyalty over time, it, to us, it's more about the growth story and having people rooting for us, basically. I mean, every day we have USPS pulling up to the back of the warehouse. We open up the thing. Thousands of packages go on to the train. I mean, it's like a small town. I mean, it is a small town, but it's just awesome. And uh, so we, our whole thing is like, let's get America cheering for us and let's be a beacon of hope. I think change can be achieved on such a huge scale if you just see one thing that's working. And uh, so we, we're, we really just try to have people participate in the growth story and the jobs that are being created, but we don't market as made in, made in America. And, and I guess the reason we don't spend our resources trying to achieve that marketing position is because we don't think it's worth it. Yeah, it, it's um, consumers really drive that. You, you know, the price being price sensitive. I had a front row seat of watching all of my products being made in America to suddenly being made overseas with the costume jewelry. When I started in the industry, and I was I was a buyer. 90% of my jewelry was made in Providence, Rhode Island. And I tried so hard to continue developing products there. And you just couldn't compete on price. So I would have programs that were made in America next to programs that were not. And nobody was buying the made in America because it cost four times to make it. So it's ultimately the consumer who makes that decision where things get made because of what they're willing to pay. Just a quick technical question. You said earlier about the ERP decision to build your own platform, and I'm just wondering what software packages you were looking at um, that could not customize any of their merchandising point of sale or um, supply chain um, modules to accommodate. We looked at us. Uh, so this is our biggest failure of last year. We tried to put in a, a system out of the box, and we spent $200,000 doing it. It was a tremendous failure. And uh, we, <laughs> I'm about to fall out of my seat talking about I still can't say the word skew. But um, <laughs> we don't have skews. We're in the process of getting skews. But, um, but we, you know, we... Uh, we tried, I mean, I won't say the system that we didn't use because it was, it was something that's, it's, it's used by a lot of fashion companies and it's, it's, it's not, it's a fine package. But um, we looked at everything from NetSuites to SAP. We looked at everything down to little, little things. The, the vendor we went with is a New York City company that, again, has great clients. Um, it just didn't work for us. But again, we have a made to order factory. It was really old school. We do, I mean, we, we are so fast paced. Like, it's, it's a fast fashion. Every day we're doing 50 different styles. We don't have time to go through a 30 step process to create a SKU. And uh, so we ended up, like, I still think the team in North Carolina took it out, like, office space style with, with baseball pads. No one will tell me where the server went, but it's disappeared. And I think it was, like, a lot of beers and a bonfire and, like, five baseball bats. <laughs> so um, we've been able, now we've, you know, have three engineers, you know, working on this in-house. And we're, it's going to work. I mean, I'm, it's one of my favorite projects that we're working on right now. And I'm so excited about it. But uh, to us, the investment was worth it because we can't scale our supply chain. And if we look at... What we're doing, our supply chain is one of our most competitive, you know, it's a very competitive part of our business. We're not going to build an inventory management system, but our supply chain for our factory is a key competitive advantage. It's very hard to do. So we're committed to building the software to support that. So Intuit recently put out a statistic that said like 60% of customers expect brands to engage with them online, but only about 17% of uh, companies actually engage with customers online. Um, Clothing is something people talk about a decent bit online about the latest purchase or anything like that. Um, so for you all, um, when you have a large scale marketing projects and advertising, uh, buying advertising and so on, how do you see the importance of allocating resources to engaging with customers in real time online about the different remarks or comments they make about your products? Can I suggest that our moderator answer this question? <laughs> um, yeah, we we work with a lot of third party companies and um, that are using social as a marketing channel, and I think 
you really want to answer the questions naturally. So if people are posting a question that is that can easily be answered by consumers, like how does this fit? Let the consumers answer it. They're going to be better able to answer that question. Where if the question or comment is about shipping or something that's logistical, it's always better for the brand to answer that because they they know how to deliver it. And I'm sure um, <laughs> Emily and Chantal will be able to speak to how Chloe Nisbell and Lolly Wally Doodle do this. So, uh, yeah, I mean we have people working the wall all day, and we uh, you know cost to us. I mean we we literally have people posting pictures of. Um, going to adopt their, their kids and they're bringing Lolly Wally Doodle outfits for the first you know, outfit that they wear. A girl standing up in church with cerebral palsy for the first time and the outfit she's wearing is all, I mean, it literally makes me tear up to think about it. But, um, and then great moment, you know, beautiful moments, the saddest moments, um, and they're wearing our clothes and, and there's really, I mean, how could we not resource that? I mean, that you couldn't manufacture that on, in an ad agency or, you know, whittling two sticks together trying to create a startup in New York Tech. I mean, that was built from, you know, a mom in North Carolina organically bootstrapping a company and uh, on Facebook just daily iterating it. What do you guys want? What do you, I mean, it's just a constant. It's a core competency of our company. It's one of the things we resource the most. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the only way that, that we do it. We have a team of people that just supports that. But it's also the nature of, of what we do because we have these merchandisers who are out there posting images constantly of how she's wearing it, um, how even even the stories around how it's changed their lives. You know, we've got, again, stories that it's funny. I, sometimes I can't even talk about them because it, uh, I'll start crying. But <laughs> it's, you know, I'm, I, you see things about... Uh, you know, for the first time in two years, I could pay I could pay all of my bills in a month to us helping um, you know women pay for her, their chemotherapy treatments. So all these types of things, these are testimonials, and it's it's real life. We don't we don't pay for pay for advertising. I mean, they they're out there advertising, and it's really about the truth and seeing how how they interact with the brand and the product and the experience. Hi, uh, this is uh, Chantel, direct for you. I, I don't know if you touched on it earlier, but you seem like you have a really good thing going online. And do you right now, are you offline? Have you done sort of kind of the other theory of having part, per, like parties with the jewelry? I feel like, are you an example of online version of that? Uh, we're, no, we're absolutely both. Um, our merchandisers are having pop-ups from, I mean, I've seen beautiful, because we're really focused on being a brand, part of the things that we do is we really encourage them to embrace that lifestyle and have pop-ups, whether it's in restaurants, I've seen them at wineries, I've seen them in parks. Um, it, it could be in someone's home, but we, we've given them sort of the tools on how to pop up like a brand versus maybe a home party, if that makes sense. Um, they're sort of really set displays that we that we focus on if you want to in fact have a pop-up. I think of it very differently. And you guys support them with all the materials and the samples? Is so there yes, so initially, because it's not a business that has to be done in person, this isn't something where they have to like buy, they don't have to buy inventory. We we ship directly to every single one of our customers, so there's zero cash and carry. So they're able to invest in in samples, but not to sell, but more for themselves to display, if that makes sense. I mean, obviously they can do it if they want to, but that's not our, our business. It's, it's more for just to showcase and to wear. All right. So thank you very much for coming today. Um, thank you so much for the panelists, and thank you for Apple for hosting us today. So Thank you, guys. Everybody join me in thanking our panel once again.